Hi everybody, this is Katya Eckhart. Welcome to my YouTube video channel. I wanted to start out this evening by modeling for you this cute denim jumper that I recently purchased. Uh, this is also an outfit that I bought from uh, Forever 21. So this is a, a really nice uh, combination, I think, for uh, late spring, early summer. Uh, the shorts, very nice short length, uh, almost like a skirt, but they're actually shorts. So it is a jumper, and I'm wearing this with uh, some new pantyhose and also with my white leather pumps uh, that are made by Steve Madden. So let me just model that outfit for you. And what I would like to do this evening, I've been away for a little while. Um, I just took a nice trip up to Scottsdale for a couple of nights to relax, um, and so that was enjoyable, but I'm back home now. And I wanted to say something a little bit about um, a recent trip that I took to a local museum here. And um, this was a, a museum that is devoted to exhibiting ultra-contemporary art. So I wanted to say something about one of the installations that was on display in the museum. And the reason I'd like to go into this is because I really am um, a fan of a lot of modern art, even ultra-contemporary art, I think that sometimes it's easy to find that kind of art off-putting because it doesn't really make a lot of sense and sometimes it all just seems kind of like a game. Um, and I think, I want to say something about that a little bit at the end of my video, um, where I think it's important to be able to have criteria, let's say, for making judgments here about well, what counts as a good piece, of conceptual art and what doesn't. So what I want to talk about today is what I consider to be a, a not a successful work of um, conceptual art. And as you know, a lot, many of you may not know, but probably many of you do, uh, conceptual art tends to be, a, the, the focus is about the idea. The work of art uh, itself can be an idea. It may express an idea, it may be an idea, uh, it, it may provoke people to have certain ideas and reflect on them. So it moves very far away from traditional visual art where the emphasis is more upon color and form and composition. So in any event, let me just get right to it and say something about this uh, particular installation that was here uh, in town and still is on display. So basically what it was, um, it, it had to do with a lot of it was like just a fairly complex installation with about four or five different set pieces. And I won't go into all the details, but a lot of it consisted of writing or maps or uh, almost like cartography. So, for example, one exhibit was basically, uh, it was almost like somebody had taken a term paper and then pasted the different pages of the term paper in sequence up on the wall. And this was sort of like the key to the installation because it explained what the installation was supposed to be about. And basically the idea was, well, this is a collective where people are trying to come together and discuss new strategies of cooperation. And it was kind of a lot of patter, you know, it was sort of this kind of jargon uh, speech. But that, that really wasn't the problem with it. One of the things that was emphasized in this was, well, look, this is about the freedom of creativity, and we're encouraging vi the viewers to participate and find their own ways of participating. So that was one of the set pieces in the installation. Another was like a map, which had a lot of symbols drawn on it, and so you were reading it like a map. It was sort of like a map of the world, but the continents were differently rearranged. And so it too was very, um, there was a lot of focus on writing in that part. And then in the other set piece that I want to describe, that was almost as if somebody had set out a bunch of kitchen appliances with descriptions of them, both next to them and on the wall behind them. So one thing to keep in mind about this installation is that there was a lot of language. There was a lot of writing. And what I want to do is explain why I think the, it, there's a conflict between the amount of language that is in the installation and what the installation sets out officially to do. The installation, as you will recall, according to the key uh, part of the installation, the key component, is supposed to encourage this kind of 
group participation where people can find their own ways of approaching the work and experiment with it, and yet it's, a lot of it is language. Now, this is the problem that I see with this, and it's quite simple. The problem is that when you read a piece of text, you can't just approach it in any way you want to. Regardless of what the text says, if we're talking about a Western European language, you have to look at this from left to right. You have to read the text from left to right. And so when you encounter these installations that consist largely of text, then that dictates or regulates how you approach that part of the installation. You have to approach it as text, which means that you have to follow it sequentially, read it, the text, from left to right. Now, con contrast that with your experience when you go into a gallery and look at a painting, let's say. And then I'm going to give another example of conceptual art later by Saul LeWitt uh, that's like painting more than it is like this installation. When you go into a gallery and look at the painting, there, nobody tells you how you need to approach it. You can come in from the left, you can come in from the right, you can look at it from left to right, you can look at it from right to left, closer, farther, it doesn't matter. You're encouraged and given the freedom to approach the work in the way that you want to, to get as much out of it as you possibly can, to have the maximal benefit uh, ex beneficiary experience of this work that you can, and it's up to you how you approach it. But that's not the case with the installation that I just described, whose name I can't even remember, even though it must be in there somewhere with all the rest of the text. Um, that installation, even though on the one hand it is encouraging you to participate in a very free and open way and sort of approach it as you see fit, you can't do that. It's regulating or regimenting how you approach the work because so much of the work consists of text that has to be read from left to right. Even if it doesn't make a lot of sense, even if a lot of it is jargon, you're still being told or regulated or regimented in how you are experiencing the work. And that is completely and diametrically opposed to the work's stated goal of encouraging participation, open and free participation. Now, in this respect, I think a more successful work of conceptual art are some of the pieces by Saul LeWitt. So basically, LeWitt would give people instructions about how to produce these works, and then they would do that, and then people could come into the gallery and approach the works that was left open. They, they really didn't consist of text, or at least a lot of them didn't consist of text. They were architectural, they were very structural, they often had a lot of little pieces, almost like jigsaw puzzles, some of them, but they were, they were not overly verbal, and so the, the, the spectator or the viewer was left free to decide how he or she wanted to uh, approach the work. And a very famous example of this is in the Phoenix Art Gallery. I can't remember the name of this work, but it basically is a huge sphere that Solowick instructed uh, the, the people who uh, installed the work to draw onto the, the, the far wall of the gallery, and no matter what side you look at it from, it, it looks exactly the same. It, it, it doesn't change. The sphere is equally illuminated, uh, it's just as bright in every part, no matter how you look at it. So that's a very interesting experiment, but you are allowed to approach that work of art as you see fit. There are no, yes, there are instructions that tell the gallery uh, people how to install the work, how to set it up, but beyond that, the viewer is not being told how he or she should approach the work, because the work doesn't consist of a lot of text that has to be read if it's written in English or German or some other Western European language from left to right. If it were in Arabic, it would have to be from right to left. But in any event, if it's in a language, it's going to have to be read and in, in a different way, in a definite way. And that means that if the work consists largely of that, you are not going to be left free in how you can approach the work. So a lot of this has to do with what I suggested at the beginning of my video where what we need is to come up with very clear, clear criteria that enables us 
to say, well, what, what is it about a particular conceptual work of art that makes it successful or not? And I've tried to say a little bit about that here. I'm not giving general rules or anything like that. I'm just giving a couple of examples so that when you go into a gallery and you encounter these works, it's not just like anything goes. There are standards, there are ways in which you can figure out how to judge and rank works according to better or worse. It's not just, you know, a free-for-all or anything goes. So that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. And again, here is my uh, romper, I should say. I think it's more like a romper than a jumper. It's a romper outfit made out of denim, uh, which I got at Forever 21. So I hope you enjoy what I have to say. And if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them uh, in, under the uh, video. Uh, thank you again for watching. Thank you for sharing your time and your patience with me. This is Katya Eckhart wishing everybody a restful and peaceful good night. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.